Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and what follows is an excerpted clip from one of my longer webinars. So what I've decided is that sometimes when people ask really interesting questions, I will pull out that particular part of a webinar and make it available to you as a short clip so that if you don't have time to watch a one-hour webinar, you can at least watch and listen to the brief exchanges that I usually have with people who attend my webinars. So here is one such clip from a recent webinar. I hope you enjoy it. Okay. Do you think that teaching post-colonial literature in junior high school and high school could be a good thing? What could it bring to society? Good question. Now, it depends on where you are. Uh, what I don't want it to devolve into is a binaristic way of doing things where, you know, we are good and they are bad. And I think a good way of doing that would be in the history classes, right? Not just focusing on what the British did or what the French did, but also telling your own stories. What were our people writing? What were our people doing? Oh, good. So, yeah, in France. Okay, so anything that points out the historical injustices, right, perpetuated by the French or perpetuated by the British, but at the same time that does not rely on a nativist idea of identity, right, which doesn't build from that a kind of resentment that incarcerates our students into a mindset that, that, that sees no path to reconciliation because that can become dangerous. It can become, you know, a path to something worse. But yeah, teaching colonial history and teaching of colonial atrocities is important. But I think what's also important is to teach a different kind of humanity which Fanon at the end of Black Skin, White Masks talks about, to create a new humanity which encompasses both and is capable of love, right? That's how I would design the curriculum for it. Very good question. Can we discuss post-colonialism as a discourse of reconciliation, which normally is taught as a discourse of further division based upon binaries? Uh, I am a strong proponent of that. I don't want post-colonial studies to become nativistic or purist. Uh, so if you read the major scholars, even Saeed, Spivak, Baba, none of them insists on a purist form of post-colonial studies. None of them insists that that is the most productive space. No, they want to challenge the past and present colonial imperatives but they want to do so without encouraging any form of nativist, purist, religious, or other identities, right? So I would highly recommend that that still be the case, that people should work towards a world in which we acknowledge that certain groups have more power, that certain groups still own the world, but not necessarily from the point of view of we are us and they are them, and never the twain shall meet. No, it should be towards finding ways of building solidarities, changing the world, but not through hate and exclusion, right? And that is where, that's why I started developing uh, my lectures on Freire, because Freire teaches us that. So if you read the pedagogy of the oppressed, he doesn't just teach us how to work with the oppressed and learn from them and, and develop a pedagogy, but he also teaches us how to incorporate in the project of liberation those who were our former oppressors. What is the relevance of post-colonial critiques to the early modern period cross-cultural encounters between the Muslim world and the West? I mean, what... Um, Relevance would be in terms of going back and rereading those encounters with the knowledge of post-colonial theory. The one of the good books by, is uh, uh, by one of the former professors from Florida State. It is called Turning Turk, right? 
and I'm forgetting his name. Now that book uses post-colonial theory to go and read about references to Muslims and why were they all called Turks, right? And that would be a post-colonial reading of, you know, early modern texts. Uh, other ways could be, you know, you reading, uh, taking the idea of European imagination, how do the non-Europeans figure in the medieval imagination, in the early modern imagination, uh, you know, Song of Roland. And, and especially there are two constituencies that figure very prominently. So early modern literature, Shakespeare and that era, the part of the Muslim world that figures prominently is, is, the, is the Moorish Spain, right? And then slightly later, it's the Ottoman Empire. The Turks become very prominently maligned and talked about in those. Now you could pick those and then you could use the post-colonial theory, just even Saeed to point out what kind of way of looking at the Muslims, the Turks or the Moors or the Africans existed and what is the significance of knowing it now, right? Good, don't you think that a decolonial approach would be more insightful, especially when it comes to questions about the Eurocentric beginning of modernity? Yeah, I mean, yes, but it depends on how you define decoloniality. I think it's becoming big in Pakistan and elsewhere too. Decolonial thought, I mean, rendering theory non-Eurocentric is a project of post-colonial studies as well. Now, decolonial thought imagined in restrictive purist terms can also become very destructive because if you become a cultural purist, if you just want to rely on your own historical text and your own modes of reasoning, by excluding so-called West from it, then you are taking away from it, you know, the complexity that you can add to any mode of thinking. So depending on how you do decolonialism, what source material you rely on, is it still open to accepting differences from other cultures? My mode of decoloniality is pretty simple. You know, you take, something from your own culture, from your own history, and you juxtapose it against the mainstream dominant European way of reason and thinking. And thus, that juxtaposition challenges a universalist stance. But decolonialism, in a sense, where we, jet, we try to jettison everything that came from outside, from the West, I think would be a disservice to our students and to ourselves because that our religious fundamentalists are already doing that. If human humanities scholars also start doing that, then there is no room to develop a kind of world where we borrow from each other. That those are my views on on decolonialism. Holy heaven. Is European thought still mainstream or dominant? Yeah, I, mean, I would say Euro-American thought. And part of it isn't because it's better thought. Part of it is that the, the look at the mechanisms, right? Uh, universities, the power of America and Europe. So in so many ways, in academic terms, especially literary studies, English studies, uh, it tends to be the dominant mode of teaching and thinking. Now, what I'm saying is it doesn't mean that the indigenous studies in Urdu, Hindi literature, right, Bengali literature, they don't have their own vocabularies or their own ways of doing things. But at least in English studies, yes, right? So the role of the post-colonial or decolonial would then be to constantly keep challenging the assertions of universality, but also to constantly keep challenging inserting, infusing theory and this knowledge with knowledge from your own parts of the world, your own history, your own philosophy. And that is what roughly uh, would be 
in my opinion, a better way of doing it. So Ashraf, uh, I'm trying to explore the way in which early modern Muslim texts contributed to the formation of modernity at times of power, ascent and descent. Yeah, okay, so I think uh, not just uh, going to literary texts, uh, go to philosophy as well, right? Especially in Al-Andalus, right? Uh, Ibn Rushd and uh, people like Ghazali, their influence, and earlier Al-Farabi and Al-Kindi and their influence. But if you want to see, and, and of course, you know, um, Bu Ali Sina, right? Avicenna. Uh, if you want the influence on European thought, uh, uh, Ibn Sina is crucial. Kanun and Shifa, but especially Shifa, Al-Shifa and Kanun, the two books, they are crucial in developing because what Ibn Sina does is a re-reading of Galen, right? And beyond that, that is what becomes the normative medical discourse of Europe, right? Uh, there are other works as well, which uh, I can't seem to recall right now, but that is a very good topic. Yeah. Thank you so much for watching or listening to this brief clip. If you are interested in the longer version, the link will be in the description and you can watch the whole webinar. Thank you so much for your support. And as always, if you have any questions, any concerns, you can always post them in the comments and I'll be happy to respond to them. If you have a moment and if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please do so now so that you get timely notifications of whatever is happening on this channel. Thank you for your support. Stay safe and as always, from me, to you, peace and love.